How many times I have just wanted to scream at the television because there's some obvious question that doesn't get asked. And a good example of this was in the Ward Churchill uh, brouhaha that's been going on. I happened to tune into the O'Reilly Factor the other night, and this was not the first time I'd seen O'Reilly railing and railing about Ward Churchill. Ward Churchill is a professor at the University of Colorado who published an essay the day after 9-11 in 2001 in which he said that it was not surprising that terrorists had done this to the United States after all the, what the United States government has been doing to other countries for the last 50 years. And he made some very harsh comments in that essay, which was called, Some People Push Back on the Roosting of Chickens, meaning, uh, referring to the phrase that the chickens come home to roost. And uh, for some reason, it came up, uh, I'm not really sure how the controversy started this year. I believe he was going to speak somewhere and at another college, and it got canceled, and this started a whole set of controversy about Ward Churchill. But when I was watching the O'Reilly Factor the other night, he was going on and on about what a terrible person Ward Churchill is, how that kind of person should not be allowed to speak, he should not be allowed to teach, the University of Colorado should fire him, and he should not have a platform anywhere to spew out his poison. And then, of all people, he brings on the show David Duke. You remember David Duke, the one-time head of the Ku Klux Klan, who ran for office in Louisiana and was actually elected to the State House long after he had resigned from the Ku Klux Klan, but was known uh, to be, uh, let's say, a defender of the white race. His critics would call him a white supremacist. And he gets David Duke on, and then he starts, ra and he gets him on to ask him about Ward Churchill. And of course, they're at somewhat opposite ends of the pool, and Duke makes that clear. But Duke says that he believes that Churchill has a right to speak, just like anybody else does, that we shouldn't silence opinions. And O'Reilly starts on Duke and going on hatefully about Duke's past and uh, trying to nail Duke as being a bad person and so forth. And in all of this, his hatred for Churchill, his hatred for uh, David Duke, which he does not hide in any way whatsoever, and just spews out all of this hatred for both of them, on what basis do you think that he says that Churchill should not be allowed to speak? Because Churchill is abusing the First Amendment by engaging in, are you ready for this, hate speech. That's exactly the phrase that he kept using over and over again, hate speech. The hate speech of the Ward Churchills and David Dukes of this country, and they should be silenced. And, of course, he himself engages, engages in a great deal of hate speech and was on that very show that he was railing against it. And in a recent article in the uh, New York Press by Alexander Zaychik, he quotes some of O'Reilly's statements uh, over the years in which O'Reilly has engaged in hate speech. The U.S. should bomb the Afghan infrastructure to rubble. If they don't rise up against this criminal government, they starve, period. On Iraq, O'Reilly said, the population must be made to endure yet another round of intense pain. Maybe then the people, people there will finally overthrow Saddam. And on Libya, we mine the harbor in Tripoli. Nothing goes in, nothing goes out. Let them eat sand. Now, I bring up all of this because we are back to what we have discussed before. And that is that people in this country in general have very little understanding of what the Bill of Rights says, why the Bill of Rights says it, why we have a Bill of Rights in the first place, what the purpose of the Constitution is, what the Constitution says, and why it is important that the Constitution be enforced literally and completely without exceptions, taking it word for word exactly as it was written. Obviously, Bill O'Reilly doesn't understand why it is important that all points of view be able to speak. We've talked before about the fact that you cannot say terrorists don't deserve a fair trial, because until they have a fair trial, you're not even sure they are terrorists. And you can't say that people who spew out hate speech shouldn't be allowed to speak because you don't know for sure that what they're saying really is hate speech. They may be speaking the truth. We have to hear all opinions in this country, or we're only going to hear one opinion, and that's going to be the opinion of the government, and we then are in Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia. We'll be right back. This is Harry Brown. I want to make a couple of things clear. First of all, I mentioned O'Reilly on this show from time to time. I have no special animus against Bill O'Reilly. It is just that he represents, in an extreme way, what is going on in this country in general, and that is that we are supposed to accept the Bush administration's line, hook, line, and sinker, and not dispute it, not argue with it. And Bill O'Reilly is just simply a scared little conservative commentator who wants to silence anybody who presents a different point of view, such as wanting to silence Ward Churchill. And also, that's why he interrupts people continually on his show. Whenever anyone's about to make a point, whenever anyone has gotten ten words into a rebuttal of O'Reilly's position, O'Reilly will interrupt him. And when he interrupts him, he does not... Uh, 
argue against the guest's position. He just simply says, oh, you know that's not true, or whatever it is, and it's just completely unwilling to engage in any civil discourse on this. And this is not unusual. This is the way it is in this country now. Um, many people just simply will not look at other points of view and consider them because to do so is some kind considered some kind of an attack upon oneself that gee if i've been wrong about this i'm a terrible person i'm a, a stupid person and i'm not going to take the chance that anybody's going to prove that now as, as i said i have no special animus towards bill o'reilly and i also have no special admiration for ward churchill the university of colorado professor i think he is dead right on the war on terrorism and the war on iraq I think that he is dead wrong about a lot of things like corporations running the country and this, that, and the other thing uh, for reasons that we've gotten in, uh, into on this show before. But I would like to point out some of the things that he has said. Uh, this whole thing erupted last month. And on January 31st, 2005, he published on the Native Village website what he calls his response to criticism of his essay, Some People Push Back, that was pub the essay that was published the day after 9-11. Now, I want to give you some exact quotes from this response. And incidentally, this is on the Radio Links page on my website, so you can read this. You can also read the original essay, and you can read an article about it from the New York Press. All right, quote, The piece circulating on, on the Internet was developed into a book on the justice of roosting chickens. Most of the book is a detailed chronology of U.S. military interventions since 1776 and U.S. violations of international law since World War II. My point is that we cannot allow the U.S. government, acting in our name, to engage in massive violations of international law and fundamental human rights and not expect to reap the consequences. I am not a defender of the September 11th attacks, but simply pointing out that if U.S. foreign policy results in massive death and destruction abroad, we cannot feign innocence when some of that destruction is returned. I have never said that people should engage in armed attacks on the United States, but that such attacks are a natural and unavoidable consequence of unlawful U.S. policy. As Martin Luther King, quoting Robert F. Kennedy, said, those who make peaceful change impossible make violent change inevitable. This is not to say that I advocate violence. As a U.S. soldier in Vietnam, I witnessed and participated in more violence than I ever wished to see. What I am saying is that if we want an end to violence, especially that perpetrated against civilians, we must take the responsibility for halting the slaughter perpetrated by the United States around the world. In 1996, Madeleine Albright, then ambassador to the U.N. and soon to be U.S. Secretary of State, did not dispute that 500,000 Iraqi children had died as a result of economic sanctions, but stated on national television that we had decided it was worth the cost. I mourn the victims of the September 11th attacks, just as I mourn the deaths of those Iraqi children, the more than 3 million people killed in the war in Indochina, those who died in the U.S. invasions of Grenada, Panama, and elsewhere in Central America, the victims of the transatlantic slave trade, and the indigenous peoples still subject to genocidal policies. If we respond with callous disregard to the deaths of others, we can only expect equal callousness to American deaths. Finally, I have never characterized all the September 11th victims as Nazis. What I said was that the technocrats of empire working in the World Trade Center were the equivalent of little Eichmanns. Adolf Eichmann was not charged with direct killing, but with ensuring the smooth running of the infrastructure that enabled the Nazi genocide. Similarly, German industrialists were legitimately targeted by the Allies. And he goes on to cover that a bit and finally says, It should be emphasized that I applied the little Eichmann's characterization only to those described as technicians. Thus, it was obviously not directed at the children, janitors, food service workers, firemen, and ran random passers-by killed in the 9-11 attack. According to Pen Pentagon logic, they were simply part of the collateral damage. Ugly? Yes. Hurtful? Yes. And that's my point. It's no less ugly, painful, or dehumanizing a description when applied to Iraqis, Palestinians, or anyone else. If we ourselves do not want to be treated in this fashion, we must refuse to allow others to be similarly devalued and dehumanized in our name. And the bottom line of my argument is that the best and perhaps only way to prevent 9-11 style attacks on the U.S. is for American citizens to compel their government to comply with the rule of law. The lesson of Nuremberg is that this is not only our right, but our obligation. To the extent we shirk this responsibility, we, like the good Germans of the 1930s and 40s, are complicit in its actions and have no legitimate basis for complaint when we suffer the consequences. This, of course, includes me personally, as well as my family, no less than anyone else. Those are the words of Ward Churchill, who is being criticized so roundly by conservatives today and who want to silence him at the University of Colorado. I agree with about 95% of what 
I just read to you from Churchill. We'll be back in just a minute. Stay tuned. This is Harry Brown. Let me just reiterate what I said earlier about free speech. You either allow everyone to speak and give whatever daffy, loony, or even seemingly dangerous opinions they have about the world, about the nation, about our government, about the Jews, about the blacks, about the Catholics, about whatever the subject may be, or else you wind up with only one allowed opinion, and that is dictated by the government. It always works out that way, that if you deny free speech to anyone, you eventually have only one opinion allowed because somebody's got to decide what is sensible and what isn't, what is friendly and what is hate, what is true and what is false, and it leads from one thing to another until the next thing you know, you just get one opinion. In Canada this past week, a man was ordered deported by the Canadian courts because he was engaging in anti-Semitic talk on his website and in public forums where he spoke, and he was writing articles about the Jews. And because of his anti-Semitism, he is being deported from Canada on the grounds that his anti-Semitic literature is a national security issue, that it is endangering the national security of Canada. Now, you can say, well, we know anti-Semites are wrong. We know the Jews are not trying to control the world. We know this, we know that. Yes, maybe we do. But so what? If you took a poll of Americans, I am pretty darn sure that the majority of them would agree with Rush Limbaugh, who said America was minding its own business before 9-11. And if a majority, and perhaps even a great majority, think that way, that's the same as saying we all know the Jews are not trying to control the world. My point is that once you say that because we all seem to know that this view is blatantly wrong, is no reason to block free speech because eventually some false idea, like the idea that America was minding its business before 9-11, will be able to gather the same kind of majority that a right idea, that anti-Semitism is wrong, can gather. And when that wrong idea gathers that majority opinion, then whatever is the contrary to that, the truth, will be outlawed. You have to have unlimited freedom of speech. That is why the First Amendment to the Constitution says Congress shall make no law infringing on the freedom of speech or the freedom of religion or the freedom of press or the freedom of assembly. It doesn't say that the government can have a compelling interest in stamping out free speech. It doesn't say that this doesn't apply in wartime. It doesn't say that false or untrue or hateful ideas cannot be spoken. It says Congress shall make no law. No law. And boy, is that important. Without that freedom of speech, without that freedom of expression, there are all kinds of ideas that might not have come to light in America over its 200-year history. We would not have been able to engage in civil discourse or uncivil discourse. We might not have let the truth find its own way. That's why it's so important also to hear other opinions from your own, because you can't be infallible. You can be wrong sometimes, and it's important that you be open to other ideas. Some of them are loony, and you can disregard them right away if you want. But you shouldn't disregard them just because everybody knows they're false or because of what somebody has interpreted them to be. You can't decide whether something is true or false on the basis of what its critics are saying. And that's too often the way we make these decisions. We hear the critics of somebody or some idea interpreting that idea or explaining that idea or telling us what that person did when we don't really know what the idea is or what the person did. We only know the way the critics describe it. And, of course, the critics describe it in a way to make it seem either crazy or hateful or dangerous or whatever. Thank goodness for the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment. It's being honored in the breach today, I agree. But it was only that document that gave us so many years in the United States of freedom of speech and freedom of religion, at least a 100 years. And we've been coasting on it ever since. But we wouldn't be coasting if it hadn't been there in the first place. All right, let's go to the phones and talk with Steve in Oregon. Good evening, Steve. Hi there, Harry. What's up? Well, I want to ask you, you just mentioned something that uh, I hadn't heard. Was that Ernst Zundel who was uh, deported? Um, yes, I believe that's the, the man's name, Zundel, Z-U-N-D-E-L. Boy, that's scary, because he was grabbed in the U.S. Are you aware of that? Yes, he was in Tennessee, and the U.S. authorities uh, arrested him and deported him uh, to Canada, or extradited him to Canada on the uh, desire of the Canadian government, and then he went to court. I didn't know anything about this case. You may know more about it than I do. All I know is that I just read today an article uh, about the Canadian court uh, issuing the deportation notice. Well, if anything, he said it's anti-Semitic, and every one of us can be called that, because he was, uh, he was only questioning the numbers of World War II about how many people died in various places and trying to document different things, so... You know, there is a group out there that says any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. 
there's a... Oh, very definitely the Anti-Defamation anti League. I'm really having a little trouble here tonight. The Anti-Defamation League uh, very often conjures that up, that if you're oh, yeah. opposed to Israel, then you're anti-Semitic. And there are some people who have been called Holocaust deniers, who in fact are not denying the, that the Holocaust existed, that there were concentration camps, that people were executed, but as you pointed out, uh, questioning whether the numbers are correct or questioning some part of it, or perhaps defending somebody who's being uh, accused of being a prison guard right. at one of the concentration camps. I can see that there is, I don't know who is behind this, but this nonsense of hate speech, because Harry, uh, you're older than 30 years old, and I don't think, I don't think we ever heard that term 20 years ago, did we? No, you're absolutely right. Or hate crime? No. Uh, well, the government has passed a law against hate crimes, and most states have laws against hate crimes. But you're right. This whole thing came up 20 or 30 years ago. This is just new propaganda. And I, I've seen how they're doing it when I was... You want me to hold on? Or? Yeah. Uh, well, if you would, hold on, uh, and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Don't go away. This is Harry Brown. Go ahead, Steve. Yes, one time I was flipping, channel flipping, and I saw something, and it happened to be on MTV, of all things. And it looked very professionally orchestrated. It was a protest. And they had a banner, and it said, Hate speech is a hate crime. And at that moment, I had a, you know, the light bulb went on over my head, and I thought, that's what they're trying to do with all this hate crime nonsense and passing these laws, like one they have now in the U.S. Congress, where they're trying to make a federal hate crimes law. They, first, they implement the hate crimes law, and then they say, well, hate speech is a hate crime. It sounds so nice, but it's total nonsense, because there's no such thing as a hate crime or hate speech. No, of course not. Uh, if you do violence against somebody else, then you should be prosecuted, whether or not there's heat in your heart or liquor on your breath or a gun in your pocket. But if you have... Whether the person has political opinions you don't like or that you're after as well, that doesn't matter. It's a crime, period. Right. And if you have not done violence against somebody else, then you should not be prosecuted, no matter uh, how hateful you may be or no matter how drunk you may be or no matter how many guns you've got in your pockets. Exactly. And, you know, it, we, we've entered into an... We're moving into an Orwellian world. I'm sure you've noticed that many things are not called what they are, like many of the bills that Congress will pass are not appropriately named. You know, they'll call it the Real ID Act when they want to make a national ID card. Mm -hmm. Well, when they, anyone says hate crime or hate speech, just put the word political in place of hate. Mm. Political speech or a political crime. Because with these hate crimes, homosexuals are a certain political group, lesbians are a certain political group. It's a political crime, not a hate crime. Mm -hmm. We're just getting political laws passed. And I agree with you 100%. Once you... Uh, uh, start to control or have anyone who judges other people's speech, you're just going to have one opinion. That's going to be the government. Right. Just like 1984, and uh, just like the Soviet Union, just like Nazi Germany. These, these are, when you hear the word hate crime or hate speech, just think to yourself, political crime. Mm -hmm. That's all I really Good. enjoy your show. Thank you, Steve. I'm glad you called, and we look forward to hearing from you again sometime. All right. And now, uh, to dress up this show and provide a little old world class, we're going to go to Denmark and talk with Molta. Hi, Brown. It's, a, it's Molta. It was me who was talking about the about how to get out of the tax system. And uh, it's true. It's uh, how to get to keep 100% of your earnings. I'm sorry, what was the last thing you said? About how to get uh, keep 100% of your earnings. Oh, legal. To, to keep 100%, yes. Yeah, it's something called expatriate. You, you really, you dump your U.S. citizenship, you get uh, you, 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 American citizenship, you get all the rights you, your ancestors had before the, the past the laws in, uh, in, uh, in 1868. Uh, and then in these old days, the past has another law about how to how to get out of the system. But uh, Jordan Maxwell and um, Vic Vic Varabelian has researched it for many years. Well, unfortunately, if you if you're an American citizen and uh, you move out of the country and you uh, yeah, I know and, all and, that. and you renounce your American citizenship, the IRS. I'm not no, sure what it's, it's not about that. It's not about I heard you, you talk about the radio. This is how to get older, and you get a letter from the IRS. We, we wouldn't have, have anything to do anymore. You fill out the, the forms, and you talk with the Victor and may, maybe Maxwell, and they all all that, and you get new uh, new uh, card, new identity card. You get a card. You can get you can get a uh, you dumping when, when you do that. You dumping your um, the social security card and all that, and you get a new card, a new special uh, identity card, and you you're getting this uh, sovereign citizen. Well, you mean, are you talking about somebody who's moved out of the country? No. Who's no. still living in the United States? They're still living, but you're a sovereign citizen. You, you, federal laws is not applying to you. Yes, but look, look, uh, I mean, right on the face of it, we know that you're living in Denmark. I tr presume you're a Danish citizen. If you came to the United States and worked in New York or Chicago or someplace else, well, the, I, I, the, I, the, I, the IRS would tax you regardless of your citizenship. So uh, an American who renounces his citizenship and continues... You don't renounce it. You fill some form the government had made 135 years ago. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, I'm sorry, Malta, but over the last 30 years, I have heard at least a dozen of these schemes that say it's there's a, a loop, there's a loophole in the law. It's and working, Malta, yeah. and it always works for a while. And the reason it works for a while is because the IRS wants you to accumulate enough back taxes that that you owe that it is worth it then to prosecute you. It, it's really not about taxes. It's about getting totally out of the system. You, you're they're not interesting in you, Malta. You you fill this form. You are not interesting anymore. Well, good, in, in good, this, right? good, good luck to you, Malta. Thanks for your call. I appreciate it. And, folks, we'll be right back. The phone number is 1-800-259-9231. We have an email from Andrew who says, I heard your rebuttal on the State of the Union speech, and I thought it was better than that by Pelosi and Reed. But something I found to be the most disgusting part of the speech was not the same part you mentioned. I heard George Bush say something to the effect of, we will not set an artificial timetable for pulling out of Iraq and then let the terrorists believe they can have their way. And Andrew goes on to say, of course the terrorists are having their way since more U.S. troops keep pouring into Iraq and providing more targets for the terrorist gangs. I guess by the logic, George Bush must figure that if we can put our troops in there, we can appease the terrorists so that their bloodlust will be satisfied and they won't come to America for blood. This part angered me the most because Bush implies that there will be no need to end this war and we can keep wasting lives for as long as we need to. Is that what you're hearing too? Well... I'm a little bit unsure as to whether George Bush really does want to pull the American troops out of Iraq. He says that he will pull them out when the Iraqis are able to take over the security functions, but whether or not that will ever come to pass remains to be seen. However, whatever happens on that score, we do know that the American government has, is planning to have 12 military bases in Iraq, and it seems fairly logical to assume that one of the reasons Iraq was chosen as the place to uh, begin getting a foothold in the Middle East was because of its strategic location with Syria on one side and Iran on the other side, and it's a fairly large country, and it provided uh, you could have bases there, you could attack any country in the region easily, whether those attacks would be for offensive or defensive purposes uh, in the minds of the people who think they're needed. Uh, that's something I cannot say. But in any event, it's going to be a long time before American troops are pulled out. There's no question about that, and there's going to be more and more dying. And, you know, we have to wonder why it is these people are so cavalier about death. Oh, of course there will be collateral da damage. Of course uh, freedom always comes at a price. Oh, of course the, you have to have sacrifices. And we're so proud of those people who have given our li their lives and so forth. How is it, we wonder, that people can talk about deaths being worth it and these things happening and that the torture is not a big problem? Well, I believe I know what the key in all of this is. And you're just going to have to wait through this break in order to hear my opinion on this, if it's at all valuable to you. But when we come back, I'll tell you why I think it is that people like George Bush, Donald Rumsfeld, and Dick Cheney can talk about sacrifices being necessary as long as there are other people's sacrifices and not ours. And we'll see what you think. All right, before the break, I was talking about the fact that people in government can talk nonchalantly about civilian casualties being a price we have to pay, collateral damage, sacrifices, all of these things, but they don't do anything to stop people from dying. They don't do anything to stop soldiers from getting maimed. They don't do anything, in short, to carry out any of the so-called sympathy or apparent sympathy that they express for these things. What is it that makes this happen? Well, I believe it's something that they have in common with serial killers. And, uh, people of that sort who just can go right on killing other people and taking satisfaction in it. How can they do that? Well, I think the key ingredient is a lack of empathy. As you know, sympathy is when you realize that somebody else is hurting, uh, going through a painful mental experience, and you express sympathy for it, uh, just simply recognizing that they're having a tough time. Empathy is when you actually feel the pain, when you are moved by it, maybe even moved to tears about something that has happened to somebody else because you can feel it yourself. You can put yourself in that person's position and feel it. Politicians, notoriously, as a group, do not experience any kind of empathy whatsoever. If they did, they would never let America get into a war. They would do absolutely anything to avoid the war. They would spend hundreds of billions of dollars of this play money they have to fool around with looking for a way to avoid war at all costs. They would take that $2.5 trillion budget and use a good part of it to hire the best minds in the world to figure out a way by which America can be safe from attack without running around the world attacking others, in short, without anybody dying, without anybody being maimed, so that they would never again have to feel the pain of a mother who has lost her son, of a wife who has lost her husband, of a child who has lost his father. But they don't have that kind of empathy. They don't really feel anything. And when President Bush at the State of the Union message introduced those parents who had lost their, their son overseas, and you could see the pain 
in the eyes of that poor woman especially, the mother of the son who had died in Iraq. You could see the pain that she was feeling, but obviously President Bush couldn't feel any of it. To her, to him, all she was was a public relations tool. And when innocent people die in an attack in Iraq or someplace else, the only thing that people like Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, or George Bush think of immediately is, how is this going to affect our public image that this has happened? How can we spin this, as they say, in order not to cause anybody to think that we are doing the wrong thing? There is no empathy, and that's the key to it. And you cannot do anything to make sure that only empathetic people get elected and would then not misuse the power to go to war. You can't count on ever just electing good people to office. You can't count on pe electing people who will avoid war. You can't count on people who say in their campaign promises, I'll do everything to keep America out of war, as Franklin Roosevelt did so frequently before World War II, and Woodrow Wilson did when he was running for re-election in 1916, and then took America into war just a month after his inauguration uh, for his second term. The only way you can stop these people, without knowing in advance who the good people are and who the bad people are, is to bind them down from mischief with the chains of the Constitution. And that worked for a hundred years, but unfortunately it isn't working anymore. And when things are set aright, as I hope they will be in my lifetime, what has to be done is to impose consequences on the people who violate the Constitution, meaning it has to become part of the Constitution itself that there are consequences for violation. When I was running for president, I said, if by some miracle I'm elected president, then I promise that anyone found guilty of violating anyone's rights, of violating any part of the Bill of Rights, will either be censured, reprimanded, dismissed, or prosecuted, depending on the severity of the crime. But that isn't enough. You can't count on a president enforcing the Bill of Rights among the people in government. You have to put it into the Constitution itself that if any violation of these rights takes place, then Congress is obligated, obligated, not encouraged, but obligated to initiate impeachment proceedings within two weeks afterward. I do have a peace amendment that applies these principles to war, but I do not uh, have not come up with anything for the rest of the Constitution. But there are better minds than mine that should be available in order to try to find a way to define a constitutional amendment that would enforce this and make it stick so we don't have to worry about who will be elected in the next generation or the generation after that and if we do then the blessings of liberty can be available to everyone in the united states and we will not have to fear an overzealous irs an overzealous fbi an overzealous cia an overzealous president an overzealous congress we won't have to fear any of those things because we'll know if they become overzealous, they will face the consequences themselves long before they can impose the consequences on innocent people. One of the real problems of government is that when politicians make mistakes, they don't pay for it. Innocent people do. The people who died in 9-11 did not perpetrate the atrocities on foreign countries. They didn't go into Indonesia and help Suharto wipe out about 150,000 Indonesians and then a couple of years later wipe out 200,000 Timorese. But members of the U.S. government did. And the result was that when the blowback came, the payback, it was innocent Americans who suffered for it. It is doubtful that a single person in the World Trade Center that died that day was involved in any of the machinations of the U.S. foreign policy. If we really want to have a rule of law, if we really want personal responsibility in the United States, then it has to be established that the people who cause these problems are the people who pay for it, not innocent people. It wasn't the 1,500 soldiers in Iraq who imposed the sanctions on Iraq for 10 years and starved little children to death. It was the people in the government of the United States, Madeleine Albright, Bill Clinton, George Bush Sr., and George Bush Jr., and their minions. They are the people who should be held responsible, not innocents, who then are made to suffer for the crimes of the guilty. A couple of email comments about Ward Churchill. Jonathan in Washington, D.C. says, I think Ward Churchill has been criticized in part because he doesn't draw a clear line between all the 9-11 victims and U.S. officials. Churchill weakens his valid position when he denounces some of the victims as technicians who aided U.S. imperialism and indirectly brought death on themselves. Personally, I think opponents of U.S. warmongering should focus our condemnation on guilty U.S. lawmakers, pundits, and mostly on U.S. presidents. After all, haven't recent U.S. presidents and presidential advisors attacked other countries largely on their own? Well, there are two things. First of all, Churchill criticized them as little Eichmanns because, as he said, Eichmann stood by and did nothing, and that these people uh, should not stand by and let their presidents and lawmakers do these things to other countries that they do. And secondly, he also said that the CIA had offices in the building and that to 
condemn the terrorists for killing innocent civilians in the process of killing CIA operatives is really hypocritical since Americans just light off as collateral damage the innocent Iraqis who get killed when America goes in to depose Saddam Hussein. He's right that these things exist, but it is questionable whether you want to hold Americans responsible for the work of the politicians. I have pointed out many times in this show that we should not blame Americans for being apathetic or uh, failing to listen to us. They've got their own lives to worry about and made of even more desperate in many cases by high taxes and so forth. But I also would point out that those who are criticizing Churchill are not drawing a distinction between innocent Americans and the U.S. officials who take us into wars. The people who are criticizing Churchill are acting as if nothing has been done wrong by either the civilians or the officials, that America uh, is completely blameless in its foreign policy and everything else, and they're just writing him off. Uh, Christopher says that you have to remember that the Bill O'Reilly's and Ann Coulter's of the world aren't there to preach the truth. They're there to be cheerleaders of the big government neocon movement. I hate to say it, but with so many distortions, I'm beginning to think the National Enquirer has more truth than mainstream news does. The neoconservatives and socialists seem to think that the U.S. Constitution doesn't apply to the government, but applies to the people instead. And uh, Christopher also says, I'd ask what are your thoughts on this subject. I feel four things precipitated the fall of the American Free Republic. Number one, the Civil War, which was a war on fellow Americans for the political cause. Number two, the decision by the Supreme Court that corporations are persons, which eventually led to bloated pork and corporations who had their hands in the politicians' pockets. Number three, the war in the Philippines, the first war for non-defensive purposes, and look where it led. And finally, the income tax, need I say more, so much for the slaves being free. And... He signs that Chris somewhere in the free sovereign republic of cyberspace. Well, I agree with you about the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln just ran roughshod over the Bill of Rights and the Constitution as a whole. And, uh, of course, he's been held up in mythological history as the man who freed the slaves when, in fact, he did exactly the opposite. He told the southern states that they could come back in the Union with no consequences, get to keep their slaves and everything else so long as they did come back in the Union. And uh, with regard to the war in the Philippines, yes, that was a terrible thing. It was an outgrowth of the Spanish-American War. The U.S. went to war with Spain, supposedly to free the Spanish colonies, but once the colonies were free, America took over some of them, including especially the Philippines, and the Filipinos didn't like it, so the Americans killed a lot of Filipinos there. That took place at the beginning of the 21st century. The decision by the Supreme Court that corporations are persons uh, did not lead to the bloated pork and, and politicians, uh, corporations having their hands in the politicians' pockets. Uh, corporations are a natural outgrowth of society. Society. It is a way by which people get together and pool their resources in order to make things happen that wouldn't be able to happen on the resources of only one person. They, they announce to the public that their liability is limited, that their personal fortunes will not be available uh, to pay off the debts of the corporation if the corporation should go bankrupt. And anybody who deals with a corporation knows that and understands it. So no fraud is taking place. The government has not protected them from their creditors. It is the creditors themselves who have decided to enter into this kind of arrangement. And as far as they're putting their hands in the politician's pocket, everybody is eligible to do that, whether he's a corporation, a person, a nonprofit agency, whatever it is. Uh, let's uh, interrupt this now to go to the phones and talk with Andrew in Florida, and then I'll try to get to some more emails before the end of the show because some interesting ones have come in. Good evening, Andrew. Evening. What's up? Um, I just wanted to have I got a comment about anybody that has already been killed in this uh, war, specifically in Iraq. I really believe that uh, Bush and his whole cattle are grounded in the panic. Freemasonry, whatever you want to call it, evil, and uh, maybe you know, the Illuminati, and all of the people that have died in this war have been sacrificed. Is it necessary to explain it that way? I think that there are simpler and more uh, self-evident ways of explaining it, and that is simply that these people enjoy having power, and they saw the Iraq War as a way of consolidating their power, not just overseas, but here in this country, by rallying people behind them and appealing to patriotism and so on. They don't have to be agents of a secret conspiracy. They just have to be doing what they see as their being in their own self-interest. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. But, I mean, it's just evil. And, and, and then to go as far as to you know, uh, explain it or uh, uh, give reason to this whole thing with you know, the Christianity, the flag, the Bible, and get everyone rallied around it when it's just so anti-Christian to begin with. Wouldn't you agree? There's nothing Christian about a war, is there? No, I don't think so. But I, you know, it's a it's a difference of opinion. And I, I of course, being on my side of this issue, look at what Bush is doing and say that Bush is using Christianity as a crutch in this instance, and his and his supporters are supporting him because to not support him is to say that Al Gore or John Kerry should have been elected president, and that's the last thing in the world they would ever want anyone to think. Uh, if you have something further to say, Andrew, hang on while we take this break, and we will be back in just a couple of minutes. This is Harry Brown. 
Well, welcome back. Harry Brown here. Let's look at some more emails. Robert in cyberspace says, I'm sure listeners would be interested in hearing about the Read the Laws proposed law by DownsizeDC.org. If you know something about it, please give your opinion. Uh, yes, as you undoubtedly know, not only do uh, lawmakers not pay any attention to what's in a bill before voting on it, uh, they couldn't care. And even if they did, of course, uh, know what was in a law, they are too ignorant of the subject of the law to be able to give an informed opinion about it. But the most important first step is to get congressmen to have to read the law that they're voting on. And Downsize DC has proposed that there be a new law that requires congressmen to sit and listen to a reading of the entire bill in order to be eligible to vote on it. If they don't sit still to hear that entire reading, then they are not eligible to vote on the law. And once that reading has taken place, then seven days must pass before any vote is taken on the law so that the public has a chance to respond. Because most of the time, a bill is passed and the public doesn't even know that such a bill is being considered. Or if they do, they have no idea what's in it. And a public reading of the bill would bring out certain aspects of that proposed law that weren't known to the congressman, weren't known to the public, weren't known to anyone. So I fully support it, and you can get more information at DownsizeDC.org. Matt in Salt Lake City says, I've got a question about how members of Congress vote on bills. I notice that most of Ron Paul's bills get sent to committee for review and get shelved before members can vote on it. Has Congress always had committees that have had the power to shelve bills before members can vote on it? Or is this a new development? Well, that's a subject I've never looked into, but I can only guess that at one time there was no committee system in Congress because it didn't have that many bills to vote on. It's when you get an abundance of bills in the hopper that you cannot possibly debate them all on the floor. So what happens is they assign committees. They create committees to look into them. This committee will look into bills of this kind, and this committee will look into bills of that kind. And then they report out what they think is the rightness or wrongness of that bill, and other members of Congress are expected to act upon the committee's recommendations in most cases. So I would say the committee system probably developed in the 20th century, uh, perhaps the early part of it. But that's all I know about it. Eugene writes, uh, you talked about the lack of empathy by our politicians. Do you believe that a politician's military service determines their support or opposition for military action or war? Not only whether they were in the military, but the specific job in the military. By that I mean whether they were a pilot or a desk job versus being an infantryman, marine, combat engineer, or other job where they actually had to face the enemy and draw the appropriate conclusions. Well, I would think that this has a certain measure of relevance to it, that there are a lot of people who have been in war, who have been in the military, and come out thinking, I don't want ever to see America go to war. I first learned that government doesn't work by my three years in the military. I could tell you even some hair-raising stories. I mean, I was stationed at Enoetok where the H-bomb tests were held, and there were people there at Enoetok that you can't imagine would ever pass a security clearance. And yet, they not only passed it, but no one there who knew them ever thought anything about the fact that they were... Uh, security risks that had passed security tests and gotten security clearances. And the reason they never thought anything about it was that they were accustomed to the fact that nothing in government works the way you would expect it would. Nothing in the military, I meant to say, works the way you would expect it would. And so they never gave a thought to anything queer or unusual that took place because, oh, well, that's just the way it is in the military. And when you see that, you begin to think, well, all of these great victories that are supposed to take place by the military, they're not going to take place for by, uh, because of brave, heroic, valorous individuals who will jump over barbed wire fences and confront the enemy and, and so on, like in an Audie Murphy movie or a John Wayne movie. No. These are people who are doing everything they can to get out of KP and parade duty and who take naps when they're supposed to be on guard duty and so forth. And uh, so they obviously are not going to do a very good job of winning wars or defending the country. But on the other hand, you also have to look at the fact that people gravitate to positions in life that are compatible with their own feelings. And people who like to inflict damage on other people are attracted to the military. Not all soldiers are brutes, but brutes do tend to want to be in the military, where their brute force, where their brutal instincts are admired and valued, rather than having jobs as garbage pickup men or learning a trade like computer programming or something else. And you just have to accept that, that this is what you get when you have a military that's going to go overseas and conquer countries. You're going to need brutes in there. And so the military does not weed those people out. It tends to weed them in. And people like that who have served in the military, and I use the word served very loosely, are not going to come back saying, hey, no, I've seen war, and it's bad, and I don't ever want to see America get into war again. So you've got two sides there, the people who were drafted in and think the military is ridiculous, and the people who were uh, perhaps joined and went in and were glad at what they saw. Eric writes to say, everyone's talking about the guy who secretly taped George Bush. 
Bush was taped in 1999 talking about refusing to discuss his marijuana use by admitting that he had used it. His excuse was, I don't want some kid telling his dad that the president smoked, why can't I? In other words, implying that he had smoked marijuana. Eric goes on to say, but no one has asked if Bush should be jailed for his behavior, which might have, for example, prevented his becoming president. If he'd been caught smoking pot in Texas, I think it would have been a 10 to 20 year sentence. But I'm not sure where he grew up. Actually, I think he grew up in New England. And, of course, no word about a president who so knowingly lies. Well, in my 2000 acceptance speech in Anaheim at the Libertarian Convention, I asked the question, would George Bush or Al Gore be a better person today if, for his youthful indiscretions, he had served 10 years in prison? And, of course, I think the answer is no. Uh, but it is an important question that should have been asked. Let's take some more emails that have come in. Pierre on Cyberspace says, forgive me if this is too personal, but how did you get involved with libertarianism and the Libertarian Party? Thanks. Well, I'll answer the last part of it. First, how did I get involved with the Libertarian Party? I was just minding my own business, as Rush Limbaugh would say, <laughs> in around 1992, and my wife said, why don't you run for president? And I looked at her horrified that here we had been married at that time seven years, and she knew me so little that she would think that I would ever run for president. That, that wouldn't happen in a million years. But we talked about it for two years. And we have a little system that we use whenever there is a disagreement between us. We go into the bedroom, we lock the door and keep the rest of the world out, and we talk about it, and we talk about it, and we talk about it until I understand. And we talked about this for two years, and finally it began to make sense for me. And so in 1994, I announced that I was going to run for president in August of 94. And, of course, the only possible party that I would consider running with, and I had to run with a party, otherwise there would be no way to get on the ballot, uh, the only possible party was the Libertarian Party. And I have no regrets about doing so, no regrets about linking up with the Libertarian Party. Uh, there are good people and bad people in the Libertarian Party like there are in any other organization, but basically speaking, I would have to say I met an awful lot of good people and uh, people who are trying their utmost to bring back the America that created all the good things that we get to enjoy today. As to libertarianism, that's a little different story, and that goes way, way back in years. I graduated from a government school in 1950, uh, having gone through government elementary school and high school, and I came out probably a budding socialist, and it took me, I would say, a few years to get over that. Uh, part of it was my experience in the Army. Well, I went in the Army three years after I got out of high school, and part of that softened me up to understand that government was not really the answer, and government was not going to solve all the problems of the universe. And I gravitated towards the Republicans in the late 50s, but by 1960, I was, it was obvious to me that they were not the answer to this. And from then on, I never voted in elections until I voted for myself in 1996. And by the early 60s, I had no doubt that I was a confirmed libertarian, although I didn't use the word at the time, but that I didn't see how government could solve any problem, and that if we could find a way to have a world without the force of government, we would be so much better off than we were. So I drifted into libertarianism. Certain people helped me along the way. Robert Lefebvre, Andrew Golombos uh, were probably the most influential people on my thinking during those years. Leonard Reed and Murray Rothbard also helped me to uh, get through to certain positions much faster than I might have on my own. The cow in Ohio writes to say, I'm a college student and enjoy your libertarian program every week, but why does the libertarian party want to end the drug war? Should we college-age voters start demanding of our current and future elected politicians to speak out why they choose to continue spending our taxes with the drug war? Um, why do libertarians oppose the drug war? Because any sort of prohibition on voluntary uh, matters that do not inflict violence on other people is bound to produce bad results. It was seen in the alcohol prohibition of the 1920s with gang warfare, people dying from drinking bathtub gin, corruption in the police and the courts because of the large amount of underworld money that was generated by the war on alcohol, uh, which was then available to spend corrupting police and uh, judges and so on. And it is amazing if you look at a graph and you see the rise in crime through the 1920s and then just an absolute steep drop in crime, in violent crime, in 1933 when the alcohol prohibition amendment was repealed by the passage of another constitutional amendment. And from then on, over a period of 30 years, even through the Depression, the crime rate dropped slowly but surely after that first initial steep drop. Uh, crime dropped considerably over those 30 years until the war on drugs started in the early 60s. And libertarians oppose the drug war because we don't want our children preyed upon by black market drug dealers. We do not want uh, people going to prison for this, overcrowding our prisons, uh, for uh, people going to prison for smoking marijuana or shooting up with heroin or cocaine or, or whatever it may be. Yes, it's terrible when somebody's hooked on heroin, but it's equally terrible or more so 
when children are shot in drive-by shootings because of the drug war. So yes, libertarians oppose the drugs war, and yes, I hope college students will join us in that opposition. One last email. Uh, Keith asked me if I've read Mark Skousen's article, The Fatal Flaw in Social Security and Medicare. And to summarize, uh, Keith thinks, feels that Mark Skousen says that the problems with Social Security and Medicare are that they're not means-tested. And he says that Skousen wrote, quote, because of means-testing, the food stamp program has far fewer problems, end of quote. And Keith says, my question to you is that if Social Security cannot be eliminated, do you think that a means-testing can be used to determine eligibility? Well, I think means-testing is inevitable because of the financial problems of Social Security, but I don't think it's the answer to anything. Government problems don't get solved. If the government then no longer has a problem paying out money to Social Security, then they'll pay out the money to something else, and they'll create more financial problems. There are no consequences to a politician for overspending. So he is not going to give up giving money to favored groups in his district that will people who will help him get reelected just because the budget is running at a deficit or Social Security is going broke or the food stamp program uh, uh, might be spending more money than people might think uh, is justified. There are no limits whatsoever. And so if you stop the politicians from spending money in one area, they will spend the money in another area. And I don't think that means testing is the answer to any program. I don't think any kind of reforms are the answer to any program. I think the programs have to be eliminated, uh, have to be pulled up by the roots. And unfortunately, that is not an option today that's being debated. Social Security should be eliminated completely. Medicare should be eliminated completely. And not only would we be better off, but senior citizens would be better off as well. Well, again, thank you so much for tuning in this evening. And I do hope you have a good week ahead. And as always, I remind you, please, please, please do something good for yourself and your family this week. Life is meant to be enjoyed. It's not a burden. And even with the government trying to put all the ills of the world on our shoulders, you still can enjoy life today. So please don't pass up the opportunity to do so. I'll be back next week. This is Harry Brown. Good night.